Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast. We are your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. My name is Robert Winfrey, and I am your host, per usual. And per usual, let's do the spiel. Please do interact with the product if you are listening and enjoying. And since I don't have the world's largest audience, I assume both are true. So if you could please like, comment, subscribe, uh, star rating, written review... Whatever you can do on whatever your podcast platform of choice happens to be, that's all deeply, deeply appreciated by everyone who puts work into these shows. Which is mostly me, but not exclusively me. So, on behalf of everyone that does, I thank you very, very much, as always. And if you've done ev- er- all of that, then sharing sharing's the best thing you can do. Let other people know about the show, especially if you think they'll enjoy it. Uh, or, you know, I mean, look, if you point someone who hates combat sports at this and... As a joke, and I get a little bit of a bump from that, I will take that too. So if you are listening to this and some uh, friend of yours has played a practical joke on you, uh, thanks for listening, <laughs> even if it, even if you're about to turn it off. I thank you. However you got here, I appreciate everyone. So thank you very, very much. All right, on the agenda this evening, last night, UFC on ESPN Plus 66. Oh, man. Oh, boy. <laughs> that card. Oh, it was so promising on paper. It was so promising. Well, we'll get into everything that happened. Um, because in practice, yee, that was uh, that was weird. It was a weird one. Uh, and this coming Saturday, UFC 277, they're back on pay-per-view. Uh, you've got the rematch between Amanda Nunes and Juliana Pena. We'll have a full preview of that event as well. And then, of course, news of the week. Now, the UFC has basically filled out UFC 280, and woo boy, that's a good one. Uh, really hoping that holds together, because that that is a... That doesn't have a tremendous amount of uh, casual appeal, but <laughs> the, uh, the critical appeal of that one is through the roof at this point. So, that and other news of the week. Uh, there were some, so we will... Touch on all of it to the extent that we are able to. All right. Let's get into the event. UFC on ESPN Plus 66. The UFC was back in London. They were at the O2 Arena. And, uh, yeah. Look. There were there were 14 fights on this card, right? That's the first problem. Was it 14? Hang on, it was 8 on the prelims. 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, 14. Um, I think you're just pushing your luck with that many fights on an event, period. So there was that. To say nothing of the fact that uh, on the prelims, I'm only going to talk about the prelims for a second, uh, there was only one finish on the prelims. Now, per usual, a finish is not an indicator of fight quality, but when you get seven out of eight fights that go the distance, you're just pressed for time, and it's a pacing issue. As much as anything else, that's what that kind of comes down to, so. And then, well, the the main card was a little bit better, but even that, oof. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Uh, so, main event ends in 15 seconds, and not in the fun way. Uh, Curtis Blades defeats Tom Aspinall via TKO, a knee injury to Tom Aspinall, his right knee in particular. We had a good 15 seconds. Both guys came out. They were uh, Aspinall looking to push the action. Blades was happy to accommodate. Both of them landed some punches, and then Aspinall lands a leg kick. And this is not a check that leads to a break. The kick lands cleanly. As he is stepping back, uh, he's a little bit... Uh, Blades threw a counter. It was a right hand off of the leg kick. It didn't really land. But the positioning, I think, of that may have played into the fact that Aspinall's weight was a little bit awkward when he came back and planted, and he collapsed immediately. Clutching his knee, uh, he was down for a while. Uh, He was in a lot of pain. He was in a lot of pain. Uh, uh, They did eventually, you know, get uh, get him out of the cage and whatnot, but I don't think we've had an official update on his injury as of this recording. Let me check that real fast. Okay, no, we don't have an official update. 
Uh, one of the uh, ringside doctors who examined him apparently told uh, told the commentary team, uh, I forget if it was Michael Bisping or Paul Felder, but one of them talked with one of the, like, when the whole thing was going down after the fight. Uh, asked him about it, and the, based on, be very, very clear, this is a very cursory examination by the doctor. His immediate speculation was an MCL tear because of how much pain Aspinall was in. Um, ACL injuries apparently don't... I'm not saying they're fun. Be very clear about that. But if you've seen people who've had the ACL injury, like they know what happens, it hurts, but they're not like writhing in agony for too long. Uh, just for too long. Like they, It still hurts, but they're usually able to kind of get up and hobble around a little bit. Like, they, this took a while for Aspinall to recover. And Aspinall's a very, very tough guy. So the MCL is apparently a more painful tear. Um, if you're curious about that, you have two ligaments that stabilize. You have, like, a total of four ligaments that stabilize, but you have the ACL and the PCL. That's the anterior and the posterior cruciate ligament. Those wrap... Um, those connect from... The front of your knee, I think it's the tibia, and then like to the, then they cross diagonally and they connect to the back of the femur. And one's thicker on the front, one's thicker on the back and anterior, posterior. Then you have, uh, I believe it's the LCL and the MCL, the lateral cruciate ligament and the uh, median cruciate ligament. And those are on the side of your knee joint and connect the bones. And the MCL is the one on the inside of the knee instead of the outside. Uh, I'm going a little bit off of memory there, so if I'm wrong, please forgive me, but that's, uh, that's my recollection about this. So that was his kind of, like, again, very, very loose diagnosis right away. The amount of pain and kind of what he was feeling, he thought MCL. Uh, the cadre, and I don't mean this negatively, mind you, there are doctors who do these kind of injury analyses on YouTube, and a few of them have speculated that we might be looking at a patella tendon rupture or a uh, quad tendon rupture. And part of the logic there is not only the physical pain, and um, those tendon ruptures are very, very painful, but if you look at Aspinall after the, uh, as he's on the ground kind of being examined, he can't straighten his leg. Uh, he, he physically cannot straighten the leg at the knee joint. And that's Apparently an indicator more, uh, that's one of the indicators is of those injuries, is if you can't straighten your leg, uh, you know, if your quad tendon ruptures, like, there's a reason you can't really straighten your leg, it's because your quad is no longer attached where it needs to be to contract. Uh, so, that's a possibility, again, we have no official update. Uh, either way, hopefully, it's, he's able to make a full recovery. This sucked! Um... And I don't mean that like the fight sucked. For what we got, it was looking to be fine. Like, they were going after it. This was not a boring... It's hard to say. That, you know, there have been boring 15 seconds of fighting. This was not a boring 15 seconds. Uh, yeah, this... Really the worst possible outcome. Logically, the winner here could have earned a title shot. Um, if it's Aspinall, you know, the guy was undefeated in the UFC on this big winning streak, had never been out of the second round even. Like, that's how he was beating good guys pretty darn quickly. You know, if he was able to get by Curtis Blades, like, yeah. The title shot, whether that's full title or interim title or whatever happens with Francis Ngannou in the UFC, who the heck knows. But whatever happens there, like, the winner of this, even if it was Blades, you know, Curtis Blades and Cyril gone for either the interim or vacant heavyweight title is a very viable fight to make. That's That would be a very good fight. Uh, unfortunately, now you know, Aspinall is going to be gone for I mean, bare minimum the rest of the year. Uh, and depending on the specifics of the injury, he could be out for a while. Uh, so again, hopefully he recovers. Sucks for Curtis Blades. You know, he, he gets a win. But not really the kind of win that you that will generate any sort of positive momentum. Not really the kind of win that gets people going. Yeah, I want to see him. He's gonna if he he's gonna be stuck fighting again before he potentially gets a title shot. Uh, now again, there's a little bit of uh, 
There's some issues at the top of heavyweight. There's a lot of uncertainty there at the moment. So when I say they could have gotten a title shot, you know, that is somewhat contingent on the UFC sorting out the top of the division in a in the near future, which they'll have to do one way or the other. You know, whether that's Francis leaving the promotion or them coming to terms and trying to get things back on track, like there's but you know, so there's a lot of ambiguity there, but uh, yeah. Uh, sucks. He's probably going to have to fight the winner of... He might have to fight the winner of Tai Tuivasa and... Um, who's Tuivasa fighting? He's fighting Cyril Gaon. Yeah, that's the France fight. Because um, Tuivasa beat Derek Lewis not that long ago. Yeah, he might have to fight the winner of that, and then... Uh, that could be for the vacant belt. Uh, yeah, who knows? It's the entire situation with Francis and Ganu casts a giant, you know, cloud of nebulosity. Not even a word. I know, I, I know, nebulous would work in that, but would it be a cloud of it? I don't know. I'm gonna go with it for the moment, and we'll just roll with it. Uh, it there's just so much that we don't know about the top of heavyweight and what's going on there, so that's the long and the short of it. Uh, yeah, hope Aspinall recovers quickly. Blades will be in position for a quick turnaround at least. You know, took no damage in the fight. I mean, I mean, Aspinall didn't take any damage apart from the knee injury, so and just very, very unfortunate. But somewhat the uh, if you're given to appreciating the poetics. This was, poetically, the only way this card could have ended, given everything else that happened. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunate, unfortunate ending to the main event. Co-main event. Jack Hermanson defeats Chris Curtis via unanimous decision, 229-28, 130-27. Curtis stepped in on fairly short notice to replace an injured Darren Till. Um... This was not a terribly entertaining fight. You can say that, certainly. Uh, Jack Hermanson did a lot of circling, a lot of sniping from distance, especially with kicks, and just outpointed Curtis over the course of the fight. Uh, I think I saw Jack Slack tweet this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it. If you get to a point in a fight where you are, where all you can do is insult your opponent or challenge their masculinity... Uh, you're you're conceding defeat. Like you're admitting that you've lost. If what you do is quit running and stand and fight me, most of the time, I'm going to stress most. That's not that's not the macho move you think it is. That's you admitting I can't beat you. And so please fight on my terms that I consider more favorable. Uh. It was, uh, the lack of cage cutting from Curtis was an issue. That was the real issue. Like, he couldn't quite manage the footwork and the movement of Hermanson. Um, Hermanson kept throwing, again, a lot of kicks. In fact, he wobbled uh, Jackson with a head kick in the second round. Now, they're opposite stances. Uh, Curtis is southpaw. So the power leg has a lot, you know, is able to get in there a little bit more. Uh... I think the more troubling thing for Curtis, and I I like Curtis Jackson. I've come around, uh, Chris Curtis rather. Sorry, thinking of somebody else. Uh, I like Chris Curtis. I've come around on him recently, but he struggles with leg kicks, and some of this also has to do with his stance. Um, Hermanson was able to off balance him pretty consistently, without throwing powerful leg kicks. And that's a combination of the stance and where your weight is, which is technically part of your stance, but your foot positioning and whatnot. Uh, he was able to just kind of tap that lead calf. And I say tap, like, I'm sure it still doesn't feel great, but he was clearly not throwing full power either. And was able to just pretty consistently displace the lead leg, get uh, Curtis off balance, and then circle. Uh, this is Hermanson, so he's circling to his own left, circling to the closed side of... Curtis's body. And Curtis just never had an answer. Um, Curtis was pissed after the fact. Uh, they, had the, they had a 
an amusing interaction, like on social media and whatnot, after the fact, uh, because immediately after the fact, Curtis is pissed, flips off Hermanson. Hermanson shouts at him, like they show a little bit more. I can't say completely show more aggression and more fight there than the whole fight, because that, that's really not accurate. But get a little bit heated for a second, and then as Curtis is leaving the ring, like he's just visibly flipping off Hermanson as he's walking out. Hermanson apologizes to Curtis, and, you know, my adrenaline got up a little bit. Sorry, didn't mean to insult you. You know, I shouldn't have done that. My apologies. Uh, apologize for the fight. He, took, he kind of mentioned to the fans, like, I was supposed to fight Darren Till. Curtis took this on short notice. You know, it kind of just is what it is. And they, <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, support the main event, guys. You know, I hope Tom Aspinall gives you a, a good event, to, a good fight to end the event on, and Jack Hermanson cursing the main event, I guess. Uh, Chris Curtis, after the fact, like on social media and whatnot, said, you know, and he's a nice, about Jack Hermanson, and he's a nice guy about it. Now, now I feel, like, once he cooled off a little bit, and, then, and he's, a, he's a nice guy about it, and he kind of, parodying the Simpsons, making you know, stupid, sexy flan, it was a stupid, friendly Hermanson. Uh, so he, uh, you know, Chris Curtis is not normally that, I shouldn't say not normally, He's not shown off his kind of hot-headed side to the major UFC audience before. Uh, so this was a little bit of that, but, you know. Once your head cools down a little bit and you kind of, you know, process, let the adrenaline dump off, you know, start thinking clearly, you know, things change about, you know, your opinion changes and whatnot, so. Uh, solid enough win for Hermanson, who kind of needed the get back. Uh, Curtis... This was his first loss in a while. He was on like an eight-fight winning streak, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't think he loses that much. You know, he fought less than a month ago when he beat Adolfo Vieira. Uh, you know, so his first loss in a while. He, uh, this was his second fight of the year. He might, he could very easily get another fight before the year ends. I mean, he, good grief. How often did he fight in 2021? Holy crap. So I'm just looking at his thing, like, he fought in January in XMMA. So, hang on, so one, two, three, four. Yeah, he fought six times in 2021. Uh, yeah, he's kept an insane pace. Uh, that, that's a very busy schedule, so he'll probably get one more in before the end of the year, assuming he's not you know, injured or whatnot. But I think Hermanson got a win that he needed after the fact. He called out. Oh, who was it? It was a fight that I thought made sense. Uh, God, I can't remember now. But uh, he had a reasonable call out. You know, he's... We might have... I said before, like, we might have seen his ceiling. And frankly, if, if he and Curtis have some kind of rematch where Curtis has a full camp to prepare, I might, I might still favor Curtis in this particular matchup. But... He's still a you know, very good fighter. Uh, I expect him to you know, get another relevant fight. And his plea for Norway to legalize MMA. Uh, yes, please, Norway. Come on, man. What are you doing? There's, you would need a... There's, I don't know of any reason why MMA should not be uh, legalized. It doesn't mean you have to like it. It doesn't mean you... you, know, you if you as the uh, relevant sanctioning bodies and government entities and whatnot, if you want to disincentivize it, that's one thing. But I don't know that, you know, having it be illegal is... Uh, I have to double say. I mean, I assume boxing's legal in Norway. That's an assumption on my part, though. I'd have to double check that. If they've just got, like, some blanket ban on combat sports and whatnot, then... I mean, at least that would be consistent if you're you know, unfairly persecuting MMA relative to other combat sports. Well, come on, guys. Uh, so, that was that. Yeah, not a great fight. Not a very entertaining fight. Can say that safely. And without insulting the two gentlemen who fought, like, just uh, the way they matched up, all the various factors, just didn't make for a terribly compelling viewing experience. Uh, next up, lightweight. Paddy Pimblett defeated Jordan Levitt via rear naked choke, 246 of the second. Um, God, Jordan Levitt's striking is so bad. It's, like, disturbingly bad for someone in the UFC. It's... 
some of it I get, uh, because not everything not everything has to be technically correct if you're able to make some of the idiosyncrasies and whatnot work for you. you know, uh, why? By way of example, why do you fight? Why do you fight with your hands up? Like, what's the purpose? The purpose is to be is to provide a straight line of attack from your from your point of origin to the target, and to check and block and defend other offense coming back your way. So why do some fighters fight with their hands down further? Well, some of that's distance. If I know you can't hit me, my hands don't need to be up. Some of it's to provide offensive variety. You know, a lot of people are used to watching punches come in those from the chambers uh, with their hands up. I mean, even in boxing, which is all punching, you know, there's different guards. I mean, why do you do one guard over the other? Any number of reasons. So if you do stuff that's not, you know, textbook necessarily, but because of either your opponent or you and other things that you bring to bear in your style and your body type and whatnot, if you can still make it work, not everything has to be technically perfect. In fact, some very, very, some of the very best fighters, and this is true of whatever your uh, combat sport of choice for frame of reference happens to be, they do things that are not technically correct. Uh... Again, this is true of every great fighter. It's just, you know, some of it's just stylistic choices. Some of it's relative to the opponent that they're fighting at the time. Any number of variables. So when I say that Jordan Levitt's striking is not very good, uh, defensively or offensively, he's, he's not bad defensively in the sense that he doesn't get hit that cleanly all that often. Um, that's, especially at distance, like his... Looking at his defense, you would not think it's as effective as it is, because it looks bad. But it do, he is able to kind of mitigate a lot of the offense that comes his way, or has been able to thus far. His striking offense is... That's the part that's a little bit... Uh, again, like, you really need to be better than that. I get that you're primarily a grappler, and fine... If you want to, if you want to be a specialist in modern MMA, that's still a viable path. But there does need to be at least a base level of uh, competence. I'm going to say competence, but that's not really the doesn't really necessarily convey proficiency. There's a degree of proficiency you need in areas that are not your speciality if you wish to be a specialist. That uh, that e I mean, even you know. Look, Habib was... Uh, I'm, I'm bringing up Habib because he was a specialist. And a very, 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 very successful one. His striking was never his bread and butter. It was never you know, everything that he wanted to do. He did have success there, though. He had a degree of proficiency on the feet, especially in as much as it fed into his wrestling game, which is why it existed. And, and that's really when he started finding a lot more success, actually, is when when he started figuring out how to blend that together. Uh, so again, more proficiency there. Levitt does not have a lot of proficiency striking. And it shows. Um, Pimblet, uh, the finish here is actually pretty cool. Levitt's going for a takedown. Uh, Pimblet gets off to the side and kind of grabs... It's not a full rear naked choke because he's not a re he's he's got one of the arms trapped, so it's a little bit more like an arm triangle, but he has the figure four grip with his arms, like, and there's no real choke here. It's not comfortable, I'm sure, but there's no re like you're not really gonna go to sleep from that the way everything was lined up. But he does have su the superior angle of attack. He's got a grip to control the head and the arm, and. He just knees Levitt in the face. <laughs> Levitt clearly wasn't expecting it. Uh, Levitt drops to a knee so he doesn't get kneed in the face again. But the motion allows Pimblet to slip to his back. He traps one, uh, get a he gets a body triangle. And one of Levitt's arms is trapped in the body triangle. And, like, that's all she wrote, guys. I, I, I mean, as unbelievably novice as I am... 
on the ground. If you gave, I mean, let me be clear. There are plenty of high-level grapplers who, if I got that position on, they're still going to escape. Like this, that that's the the skill disparity there becomes insurmountable at a certain point. But if you can disable one of your opponent's arms while you have their back, you win. It might take some time, and depending on how good they are at hand fighting and whatnot, but you have. Cr- this is an interesting thing. I, I forget what John Danaher calls it. But even if I've got your, if someone has your back, there's still some parity of weapons because your legs are controlling my hips. So you can't use, you are using your legs for control and to help maintain position, but that's all they're doing. You're not attacking with them necessarily. My legs can't be brought to bear, not really because of the position. And again, there's ways to fight that a little bit, and your legs are certainly important, but they're not contributing to the offense in any kind of real meaningful way for the most part. You are trying to choke me if you've got my back, and I'm trying to defend. And what what weapons do you have? Well, you've got two arms, and you're trying to choke me. I've got two arms, and I'm trying to defend. You can't really use your legs to help with this attack, and I can't use my legs to help with my defense. Again, this is a broadly speaking. So we've still got a degree of you know, parity here. Because all I have to do, for the most part, to avoid being choked is control one of your arms. It's not that it's impossible to choke someone out with one arm from a rear naked choke position, but it's really hard. Uh, it's why so many MMA fights uh, stall out in the with someone having the back, because it's so hard to actually finish from that position if the other guy knows what they're doing, especially if you've got gloves. I mean, what's that famous story about um, uh, Marcelo Garcia? One of the best black belts of his generation, if not the best. You know, Grappling accolades out the wazoo. Takes an MMA fight, and uh, I think it was Eddie Bravo who was like, consulted the guy who was going to fight him, you know, or the coach of the guy who was going to fight him. Like, going to fight Marcelo Garcia. Um, what should I worry about? And the advice that was given was, you know, the gloves make choking a lot more difficult from the back. Marcelo Garcia was one of the best back takers ever. And he's going to get your back, so know how to defend from there. And that's what happened. You know, this guy, this MMA fighter who... Nowhere near the grappling accolades of Garcia, of Marcelo, right? Nowhere near. Garcia got his back. Uh, you know, which was somewhat to be expected, but he was not able to mount a significant choke attempt from there because of the hand fighting. This happens all the time in MMA. It's pretty darn common. What you need to do is remove, you need to create asymmetry, right? Again, the, the symmetry here is, technically speaking, if you're on the bottom in guard, you actually have asymmetry in your favor because you can use your, your arms and your legs to attack and defend while your opponent's really only using their arms Again, that's a slight oversimplification because of how you use your legs to set up passes and whatnot. So forgive me for speaking broadly, and please don't lose your mind at me. But you need to create asymmetry. And if I'm on your back, you know, both of our legs are functionally out of the equation, I need to deal with your arms if I'm going to have a real shot at finishing you. Now, you, uh, BJ Penn used to do this all the time when he'd take the back. He would, because he was so darn dexterous, he would trap an arm. And that's it. You are now, if you have to defend a choke from a guy on your back and you only have one arm to there too, you can't do it. You, it, There's a time limit there, mind you. Like, if you know, Could you defend from that position for a number of seconds? Maybe even a minute if you're really good. Yeah, not impossible. But you are not, that is not sustainable. It is an untenable position. You cannot sustain a stalemate even defense from that position. You have to change the conditions. You have to get that other arm out. Otherwise, inevitably, you're going to get choked. And it didn't take Pimblet too long to get that choke here. You know, Levitt, to his credit, he tried to fight it, but if you can't get that arm out, then you 
again, it, it's checkmate. It's forced mate, you know, however many moves down the line. I don't use the, you know, jujitsu as human chess analogy very often because I find it inaccurate in, in some respects. But in this case, you have now created a position where the other guy cannot win under the until they change the conditions of the game. And if you can't, you can't. And Levitt couldn't. Um, I'm not a big fan of Patty Pimblets. I find his general presentation to be obnoxious and not in the not in an endearing way. And I don't like the preferential matchmaking that he's getting. Um, now, let me be clear when I say that. Let me, let me be very clear. There's a bunch of Pimblet supporters who might be clamoring for him to be, you know, fighting further up the card than he is. And when I say, not card, ranks. Look, this was the guy's third UFC fight. This was Levitt's um, fourth UFC fight? Third or fourth. Uh, so, this was the level of experience, roughly speaking, that he should have been fighting. When I say he's getting favorable matchmaking, this is not so much, you know, I want him to fight, you know, somebody ranked in the top 15. You know, one of I don't want him to fight like Brad Riddell. That seems a little... Or, you know, Rafael Dos Anjos, you take your pick. Like, somebody... Like, that seems a bit much. I'm not calling for that. But preferential matchmaking in this instance is more about styles than it is about experience. I mean, look, Conor McGregor was given very preferential matchmaking until they couldn't anymore. Yeah? But... For the most part, he was given a pro- appropriate levels of opposition. Uh, I mean, his debut was against Marcus Brimage, who he had a few UFC fights under his belt, but I mean, that, that was an appropriate opponent. You know, when he fought, he fought uh, when he fought Max, like that was an appropriate level opponent. Uh, it's more about like who didn't they match him with. You know, he didn't fight anyone who could shoot a decent double leg until he fought Chad Mendez. And if you'll recall, that was not supposed to be Chad Mendez. That was supposed to be Jose Aldo. So he was, that's what I mean when I say, you know, he got, he got a lot of preferential matchmaking there. Like, who can we book this guy against that's a somewhat reason, that's a reasonable name, that's a of a reasonable skill level? but who is not going to threaten the potential cash cow. And Pimblet's getting a little bit of that. And I don't like that. I don't like, now, to be clear, like, boxers do this all the time, especially early in your career. Like, you you are cognizant of who you should be fighting. And you cherry-pick styles. And it's, a, it's not like the match, this is not an MMA or UFC thing that's like, oh, they do this wrong and everyone else does this right. No, this is a fairly universal problem. It manifests differently because boxing has less. Boxing doesn't have matchmakers the way the UFC does. Like the, the boxing model does not really allow for the matchmaker in the same way that you know Joe Silva or Sean Shelby is the matchmaker for the UFC. Uh, the entire model is different, but the end result is still kind of the same. It, again, it's just the mechanisms are a little bit different, and I'm not a big fan of it in boxing either. Granted, not everyone's Vasily Lomachenko is going to come in with you know, 300 amateur fights and then in his first like three fights be a world champion. That's a little bit ridiculous. But I, I just don't like preferential matchmaking in that respect. It annoys me. And Pimblet's general presentation annoys me, which is all to say that when he got on the mic after the after the fight and talked about his friend who committed suicide during the week, and he said very publicly, you know, there's too much of a stigma around men and men's mental health. And if you feel that there's too much weight on your shoulders, find someone to talk to. I would so much rather have my friend crying on my shoulder than be going to his funeral. You know, yeah. Uh, completely one million percent, yes. Uh, and if I'm saying that about a guy who kind of annoys me, <laughs> you know, uh, he's he's right. He's absolutely right about that. Uh, so I, I take my hat off to him for being correct about that, for being public about it. Uh, you know, that's not an easy thing to talk about. And, that, and that's not even like you know the stigma around men's mental health. That's slowly being broken down, and thankfully. Uh, that's more like you know, sharing that someone that you're a good friend with 
you know, killed themselves. Uh, that that's hard. It's really hard. Uh, so again, I give him tremendous credit for saying what he did, for taking the stance that he did, uh, and he's he's right. He's absolutely right about that. So my hats off to him in that respect. Uh, still find the majority of what he says just obnoxious in the extreme, but. Uh, other people find it enjoyable, and that's part of what draws them to him. So, you know, who the heck am I, right? Uh, light heavyweight. Oh, this. This was a little bit sad. And entirely predictable, but it always sucks to see. Uh, Nikita Krylov defeats Alexander Gustafson via knockout, just punches 107 of the first. Yeah, this was rough. Um Gus, uh, Krylov caught Gustafson pretty early with a right hand, dropped him, and just never let him recover. It took a bit to get to the actual finish. Uh, came when he... Had he caught a Gustafson? Yeah, he had caught one of Gustafson's kicks. And just short uppercuts from <laughs> close distance, he dropped him with them, pounded... I, uh, it sucks for Gustafson. Um, that guy gave the hardest fights... The hardest fight of John Jones' career to this point. To this point. Still the first Gustafson fight. I still maintain I scored that the fight between Gustafson and Daniel Cormier for the light heavyweight title. I scored that for Gustafson. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there's no case for Daniel Cormier to win that fight. I'm not saying there's no case. I am saying I thought Gustafson won that one. You know, He gave Daniel Cormier maybe his toughest fight. He absolutely gave John Jones his toughest fight. This is a guy who... I've never understood the argument that he beat Jones the first time. That's I've never seen that. I've never seen that. I do think he beat Cormier, though. And he could have been champion. He, he gave tough fights to the two best. And arguably beat one of them. And it just... Injuries and time and all of that, it just, it catches up. And his, his chin is pretty clearly gone. I mean, we talked, you know, he'd been out for a couple of years before this fight. You know, that ill-fated comeback at heavyweight before that, when Fabrizio Verdum just kind of handled him. Um, whatever the laundry list of reasons, you know, some in-cage wars, and he had some wars, man. He had some brutal wars. And he got stopped brutally a couple of times, too. Like, that rematch with John... That was rough. Like, John John beat the crap out of him in their rematch. Um, Rumble, Anthony Johnson, pretty violently finished him. And he's he's had some... that And, you know, the out-of-cage injuries that he's dealt with on occasion, like, it sucks. It really does. But I, I think he's done. I think he's probably done. Um, solid enough win for Krylov, who should be fighting... He's still really good. And he's still really good. I think he said uh, he wanted to fight Vulcan Uzdemir, whose fight we'll get to in a second. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm down for that. That makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. All right, speaking of preferential matchmaking, Molly McCann defeats Hannah Goldie via TKO, 352 of the first. Not a lot to say here. Hannah Goldie is not... She's not very good. Um, she's... The woman is physically built. Uh, I, Brian Campbell of Morning Combat like refers to her as the muscle as the Sean Shirk, you know the muscle the new muscle shark, which is a giant disservice to how good Sean Shirk actually was. And I'm not a fan of Sean Shirk's by any stretch of the imagination, but Shirk had a degree, a very significant degree of success in MMA, both at welterweight and at lightweight. You know, dude was a champion. And successfully defended it. Um, he's <laughs> the fact that both were just you know el- the fact that uh, this woman is very well physically built like that is a uh, she is physically strong and you, you just look at her and like yeah she's yoked that is a yoked up woman but comparing her in any way to Sean Shirk is just no um, I think I saw Jack Slack tweet that like. The the pre-fight warm-up little video that they show of fighters warming up in the back before their fight, they showed Hannah Goldie hitting pads, and 
you know, Slack's joke was, well, I hope she can recover from the loss she just took to the pads. Her striking's not very good. She's physically strong, but her takedowns aren't that great. Like, there's just, she's just not very good. She was here to make Molly McCann look good. And she did. I don't have a whole lot else to say about this one. Uh, Molly McCann, after the fact, like, uh, calling out every other fighter on this card, like all those fighters who didn't want it and whatnot, and just, uh. I mean, look, I'm okay with calling a spade a spade. Not a great night of fights. I don't think it's quite as bad as other people were making it out to be, but not a great night of fights. But for someone who is, um, uh, how do I say this? Recently, Molly McCann has been uh, defending the UFC. She believes the UFC fighter pay system is fair, and look, they're flying me around, and you know they're paying for my flights and my hotels and whatnot, and hey, that's great. You know, have live your life, enjoy it. Understand, though, that goes away with two losses. All of it. All of the preferential treatment, all of the UFC being kind to you, all of the UFC going, sure, we'll fly you out, sure, we'll put you up. Yeah, gone. The minute you start dropping off performance-wise, that is gone. And all you have left, and you have nothing left to show for it. All the, all the nice trips, all the nice hotel rooms, all the comp flights, they don't mean anything. They do not mean anything. Uh, but so she, again, like, she's doing the, I'm defending the UFC at every available opportunity, and fighter pay is not really a problem, and look at all the great, and, uh, I, that annoys me. There's, there's arguments to be made, believe it or not. Like, I've beat the drum for fighter pay a lot. There's arguments to be made about the UFC's structure that can hold a degree of validity. Uh, those th- those do exist, and I don't find them terribly compelling, first of all, just for the record. But I'd be it would be foolish of me not to acknowledge the existence of rhetoric that defends elements of what the UFC does, or at least avoiding going the full boxing route uh, in a lot of respects. And again, I don't find them the most compelling arguments, but there's way, there are people who can make those arguments. And when your argument boil, when your counter argument boils down to Some variation of, well, if you want more GOAT, you have to earn it. Or, but doesn't, but look, the UFC does nice things for me on occasion. Um, that doesn't carry much weight. You know, I I think it was Chael, you know, Chael Sonnen will occasionally talk about, you know, Dana White took me and my wife on our honeymoon, like he flew us on his private jet. It was a great experience and whatnot, and I'm not saying it wasn't a great experience. I'm saying... That's Dana White's private jet. And Chael Sonnen was part of events that generated a lot of money. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying he would be in a position to buy his own private jet. That seems a bit unlikely. But Dana's showing you a taste of all the fruit, of all the benefits that he gets based on the back of labor from the fighters and how little they are paid relative to how much they draw. Uh, I mean, what are the other ones? Like Daniel Cormier and I think Daniel Cormier and Michael Bisbing both. You know, talk about how, uh, you know, they got these random bonuses from Dana White or you know, Dana White called them up and just, you know, you're hurting a little bit financially. Here's X amount of money. And I'm not saying that doesn't matter. I'm not. I'm not saying that if you're hurting financially and you're, your boss calls you up and says, here's X. You know, I, we know you're hurting a little bit and you know, blah, 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 like whatever the rationale. Like, I'm not saying that's not nothing. It mean, In fact, some of those fighters and those circumstances and their families, it means everything. But the reality is you shouldn't be in that position to begin with. You know, the UFC is slated to make a billion dollars this year. And they're still paying, and their fighter expenses are still, you know, 15%. Uh, 
so I, I'm just... Eh, I've taken a much dimmer view lately of a lot of people trying to defend the UFC structure. You want to make arguments about how far it should... how much it should change? I think... I think that's a more reasonable position to take than, no, it's actually fine. It's not fine. It's really not. So, Molly got a win. You know, good for her. It was a good win. It was a good finish. Um, but this was a setup fight. Let's call it what it is. And kicking off the main card, Vulcan Uzdemir defeats Paul Craig via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the boards. Um, not a great fight. First round, I was... I actually gave Craig the first round, uh, but the first round was fine. Uh, no real complaints here. A little bit awkward, but uh, as the fight wore on, it was just a lot more of Paul Craig throwing his weird kicks, trying to pull guard, Uzdemir not letting him pull guard, and then making him stand up and punching him a couple of times. Then Craig... Tries a kick, tries a tie-up, pulls guard. Rinse and repeat. Not terribly interesting. Don't have much to say here. Uh, that was the main card. As for the prelims, uh, Ludovic Klein defeats Mason Jones via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the boards. Um, pretty good win for Klein, actually. Uh, I, I thought this was a decent, decent little fight. Not great, but not a bad fight. I just, it was unfortunately you know, it came on the back of just all these decisions. Um, but yeah, Klein, good performance from him. You know, Mason Jones has some ability, but there's a real lack of refinement here. Um, just you know, again, just Klein a little bit better everywhere. I mean, the fact that Jones in the third round wound up pulling guard. I mean, best case scenario for Jones that was one round apiece, and it was again on the official cards it was two zero for Klein. Uh, don't understand the decision to pull guard there. Like, his guard game is not that great. Uh, I don't know if he just n knew he couldn't win on the feet, couldn't get the finish he needed, but uh, not a great decision. But solid win for Klein. Uh, lightweight, Mark Jacquezi defeated Demir Hadzovic for unanimous decision. 230-26 is 130-27. Uh, Mark Jacquezi um, was the joke. You know, after Khabib Nurmagomedov beat Ally Aquinta, there's like the the joke about the legend of Sugar Khabib with his you know lightning jab. So this would be what um, Mark Jacquezi made of, <laughs> or uh, some wrestling joke. Uh, yeah, like he just wrestled. Mark Jacquezi just wrestled Demir Hadzovic for three rounds. Didn't do much with it. Didn't do much damage. Just Takedown, top position, control, all three rounds. Not a lot to say there. Um, I'll talk about one of the points that I heard, that I saw made about this later, but I'll get back to that in a second. Um, featherweights, ooh, this one. Nathaniel Wood makes his featherweight debut. He'd been at bantamweight prior. Uh, defeats Charles Rosa via unanimous decision. 230-26 is 130-27. Nathaniel Wood looked really good here. Uh, he carved up Rosa's lead leg with calf kicks. He uh, His striking looked sharp. Uh, had some uh, good avoidance of the grappling, some good clinch control. Uh, he'd been out for a while. I mean, Wood had a lot of uh, hype at one point at bantamweight. Had a couple of setbacks, some of which you know arguably shouldn't have happened. Like when he lost to John Dodson, that might have been Dodson's exit from the UFC. Like they were trying to give Dodson a very unceremonious removal from the promotion, and he went out there and he stopped rising prospect that people were kind of high on. So, uh, Wood now, again, now up at featherweight. Uh, he looked really good here. So, credit to him for that. You know, Charles Rosa, uh, not a world beater, but he's given some really good guys some tough fights. You know, this was not an easy fight, but uh, you know, Wood looked really good here. So, credit to him. Uh, our only finish on the prelims, Jonathan Pierce defeated Makwan Amir Khani via TKO, just ground and pound stuff, 4 10 of a second. You know, Amir Khani gassing out, you know, good three minutes. That's about all he's got. That's about all he had here. Uh, he went in for a single leg pretty quickly. Some really nasty elbows from Pierce. Uh, he cut him open while, while kind of hopping around on that single leg, just 
uh, some really good stuff there. Uh, the usual kind of front headlock sequence from Amir Khani, but that's sort of all he's got. And Pierce defended that well, and then once he gassed in the second, just took him down. Then uh, just beat the crap out of him until he broke. Pierce is pretty good. He's had some ups and downs in the UFC, but... Actually, he's had a lot of ups. He debuted on short notice at lightweight against Joe Lozon. Losing to Joe Lozon in 2019 is not exactly a great... Uh, not a great start to your UFC run, but... He moved back down to featherweight, and he's 4-0 since then. Uh, yeah. Pierce is pretty good. He's pretty good on the feet. He's a good wrestler, good scrambler. Uh, yeah. Pay attention to him a little bit. Um, at flyweight, Mohamed Makayev defeated Charles Johnson via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the boards. Watch the first three minutes of this fight, and that's it. That's all you need. The rest of the fight is just that. Um, Charles Johnson is pretty legit. He had a lot of success in the LFA. I think he was the LFA flyweight champion. Uh... He's been around the block, uh, and he's had some pretty good fights. This fight was just Makayev getting a clinch, getting a takedown, Johnson immediately bouncing back up to his feet, but not being able to get out of the clinch. Makayev then usually would just slip to the back standing, and Matt return, immediate bounce up, Matt return, immediate bounce up, like just that. Over and over and over and over again. It was a lot, there was... I don't think Makayev did any significant damage throughout the entirety of this fight. Uh, this and Mark Jacquesi, um, and actually a little bit the Jai Herbert fight, which we'll talk about next. Um, if you want to know what made one of the things that made um, Khabib so special. And I bring him up in particular because what he did it, uh, and the way he went about it influences a lot of what goes on in MMA right now. And you get a little bit of this with um, Makashev, but not not quite the same amount, actually. Makashev's a very different style of uh, grappler than Khabib in a lot of respects. But what made it, one of the things that made Khabib so great wasn't just his mat returns, it wasn't just his takedowns, it wasn't just his control. It was all of those things. Like Those are all there. But Chikese had a lot of that. Now, granted, not to the same level, but the same principles. Makayev here had a lot of that. Same loose principles. What separated Khabib from the average fighter nowadays who uses some of the same meta adjustments and you know, strategic attacks? But, like... Again, watch Makaya versus Johnson here, then watch Khabib versus, I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, I do. Um, watch him versus uh, Albert Trujillo. And you'll see a lot of similarities in a lot of respects. But, you know, if you want to do this in real time, then feel free to pause the show, watch the two fights, and then come back and I'll tell you what the difference is. But look, think about what the difference is. The difference is a commitment to damage. Watch any Khabib fight. That man can't always do the most damage. Can't always do the most damage because of position and you know, how much body weight can you really get into some of the strikes he's throwing. Some of the times, all he's doing is throwing arm punches. But he's really throwing them, and he anywhere he can, anywhere he can, if there's a if he can punch you in the face, he will. That's what's missing from so many guys right now who try to do the same thing. They haven't found out how to mix in damage along the way. This is, a, again, prime example right here. Makayev did not really do anything to hurt Charles Johnson. Mark Jacquesi did almost nothing to damage Demir Hadzovic. If you're going to try and replicate elements of Khabib's success, that has to be a key component of what you do. You have... Because that's what made it work. 
So much of why his stuff worked was, oh, I'm not in a great if he's fighting. I'm not in a great position here. Um, but I can, you know, maybe I can hang out. Maybe I can wait for a slightly better moment to try and do something. Uh, or I, you know, I can bounce right back up. Okay, you bounce right back up, and I get punched on the way. I get taken down, and I get hit. And then I bounce up, and then I get hit. And then I get taken down, and I get hit. And I bounce up, and I get thrown, and I get hit, and I get hit. And then I, then my hands don't quite go where they need to be to post. And I'm trying to block, and suddenly the, the, the avalanche, right? It starts small, but it just builds, and it builds, and it builds, and it builds. Uh, <laughs> that's absent from so many of the fighters right now trying to replicate a degree of his success and a degree of his strategy they're not putting damage on their opponents. And I'm not saying it's easy. What Khabib did was very labor-intensive, first of all. And it took a lot of... Tracking Khabib's career trajectory, actually, if you look at how he fights fight to fight, especially for his his UFC career, it's interesting to see the changes he makes along the way. Because he makes some very significant changes over the course of his career, if if you know how to look at the details. And, but you need to be able to put damage on guys. Uh, if you can't, uh, especially with the scoring criteria being what it is nowadays, that's easier to overcome than it used to be. But, you know, Mikhaev has a very decorated amateur career. He's, unde- he's undefeated as a professional. He's, he's, a fly- he's got some ability. You know, I, I bring it up specifically because it was very evident in this fight that that's a missing component from his game. But he's still got a fairly significant upside, you know. No credit, so good on that. Uh, Jai Herbert defeated Kyle Nelson via unanimous decision, 29 20 across the boards. Um, I think Nelson had the first round, and then Herbert just... Nelson gassed a little bit, and Herbert was able to more or less wrestle his way to victory through rounds two and three. Uh, not a great fight. Let's see, Victoria Leonardo defeated Mandy Bohm via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the boards. Uh, Bohm did not have a whole lot here. Um, Leonardo's offense wasn't exactly great, but, uh, I don't remember a tremendous amount about this fight. But, uh, yeah, a decent enough win for Leonardo. And kicking off the main card, Nicholas Dalby defeated Claudio Silva via unanimous decision, 229-28s, 129-27. Uh, I like Claudio Silva, you know, but... His inactivity has been a real problem. His cardio is a real problem at this point. I mean, the man's almost 40. He's 39. I mean, this was like 39 versus 37. So, I mean, neither of these guys are spring chickens. <laughs> but Silva, good first round. But Gast and Dalby won the next two. You know, I don't even object to the 10-8 that one judge gave Dalby uh, at all. I think you could argue a 10-8 for Silva in the first I think I gave him one, but, eh, again, that's arguable, and I probably shouldn't have. Uh, you know, that said, you know, Dolby getting a 10-8 second, I think, is perfectly reasonable. Uh, you know, this was a fun little fight. You know, not great, but fun little fight. Um, yeah, there were some fighters that got kind of screwed on this one. Let me talk about the bonuses. There was no fight of the night, which... Eh, like I said, I don't quite know where you'd go with it. Maybe Dalby and Silva. It's either Dalby and Silva or Wood and Rosa, I think. Which is weird, because like Wood and Rosa was not nearly as competitive as you normally think a fight of the night, but... Um, occasionally, the UFC has given performance of the night to a fighter who wins a decision. I thought Wood, maybe, you could argue in that case, but the UFC decided to... Remind everyone that they want you to finish fights, so they gave bonuses to all the fighters that got finishes except Curtis Blades, because screw you, injury. So, Patty Pimblett, Nikita Krylov, Molly McCann, and Jonathan Pierce. Uh, Instead, I have no issue with the UFC giving bonuses to every fighter who finishes a fight. I don't object to that at all. Uh, In fact, I think it's a better way to incentivize fighters to fight the way you want them to fight. Uh, Rather than... Uh, the way it's been done, but, you know, what do I know? Um, so why this card was looked at with some kind of, like, a lot of letdown and derision, almost. 
your first four fights go the distance. And some of them are not... You know, Nelson and Herbert, not very... You know, the first fight's fine. It's a perfectly acceptable fight. The next three are forgettable. Then Pierce beats Amir Khani, gets our first finish. Then you have four more decisions in a row. Wood and Rosa, fine fight. Jacazi and Hadzovic, forgettable, not interesting. Klein and Jones, perfectly acceptable. Uzdemir and Craig, oh boy. Then you get Molly McCann, who gets a little bit of life from the crowd. Nikita Krylov deflates the crowd a little bit because watching Gustafson get bludgeoned like that. Uh, you know, not a lot of people wanted to see that, but got a finish. And Pimblet gets a win. Then Hermanson and Curtis have their... Again, it, it wasn't a very entertaining fight. It just wasn't. And your main event ends with a knee injury in 15 seconds. Like, um, this was a very good card on paper. I went to bat for it in some respects. Uh, did not play out that way. Also, please stop booking 14 fight cards or more. Just stop. Stop. Don't do that. Uh, anyway, if you want my full report as well as my round-by-round -round scoring and whatnot, the MMA Zone of 411mania.com has my full report for UFC on ESPN Plus 66. So, to anyone who followed along live or read after the fact, I thank you very, very much. All right, moving on. Uh, took a bit. UFC 277 coming your way this Saturday. Um, this card has suffered some setbacks. <laughs> Um, but your main event, a rematch for the women's bantamweight title champion, Juliana Pena defends against Amanda Nunes, the woman she beat in a giant upset not that long ago. These two were the coaches for the season of the ultimate fighter. No one cares. <laughs> uh, yeah, tough is, I've made my position on tough fairly clear at this point. How do I think this is going to go? Um, I'm, I picked Nunez the first time. I'm still going to pick Nunez again. <sighs> I will... Look, I was very surprised when Pena won. That very much surprised me. Will not be as surprised this time if she wins again. Uh, that said, Nunez has detailed all of the problems she had in that camp going into that fight. And, look, this is just what happens when you fight a lot. Especially if you're fighting, you know, people near the top of the division. You can have all the advantages in the world. One of those days, you're going to, if I'm, you're iterating, right? And you're iterating stuff with a tremendous number of variables. Sometimes you're going to come in injured. You might come in sick. You might have personal problems that are hanging over your head. Uh, your opponent might have... Look, when you're at the very top, and Amanda Nunes was at the very top, what you have to be able to do, and this is not tenable, mind you, not sustainable, you have to be able to, on your worst day, your absolute worst day, beat the next best person on their best day. And that's not sustainable. It's one of the reasons long-term dominance in mixed martial arts is so rare and so impressive. Because there's so many variables. There's so many ways to lose a fight. There's so many times when you might have an injury. And you might have a personal problem. You might have illness. You might... Any number of things. And the other guy, or girl, might be having everything click. You, you roll the dice enough times, you're going to hit a one. That's just reality. So the question then becomes, how repeatable is that? Well, Pena's got a good chin, it turns out. You know, a lot, I mentioned this before. You know, a lot of women, the first time Amanda Nunes hits them, they get wide-eyed. Like, they don't, they've never been hit that hard. Uh, Pena didn't quite have that reaction. She's got a pretty good chin, so... That got showed off. Uh, if she's able to again force Nunes to fight stupidly and just gas herself out, she can win this fight. 
I don't think that's going to happen this time. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm still picking Nunez. Still not going to be shocked. Not going to be shocked this time if Pena wins. She's proven that there might be a little bit of uh, Styles making fights here. You know, N- Pena does not have good defense at all. Striking, Just none. But if if what you're doing is paying. If your strike, if my strikes can't deter you from just pressing forward and still punching me back, and you're willing to pay the cost in brain cells down the line, uh, you know that's your that's a that's a calculation that you have to make. And if Nunez can't force Pena to fight differently based on power, uh, that can change things. It can change a lot of things in a hurry. Actually, it's still not great to have that poor defense. It's really bad, actually. But it can also win you some fights if uh, if an aspect of a fighter's game that they've relied upon doesn't work the way they think it should. Uh, picking Nunez, but, you know. That one's a lot closer than I think we all gave it credit for. So That's your main event. Co-main event for the interim flyweight title, Brandon Moreno, former champion, will fight Kai Kara France. Um, these two fought in 2019, actually, with the, where Moreno won a decision. Um, obviously, they're both in very different places at this point in time. I've gone back and forth on this one a lot. Look, Moreno has a lot of ability, but the way he fought Davis and Figueredo in their third fight when he lost the belt... Uh, that was troubling. It was really troubling because that was a very winnable fight. And I don't just mean like he's proven that he can beat Davis and Figueredo. I don't, I don't mean that just that. Like He made a lot of very bad decisions in that fight. And he made them consistently. If he's not sorted out his decision making in cage, like Kara France will beat him. Uh, I think Moreno's a bit too dynamic ultimately. You know, Kai Kara France has really figured himself out over the last little bit. Uh, he, he was a little—he had a good run in his first little bit through the UFC. Then he had the Moreno loss. That was his first loss in the UFC. The loss to Royville was pretty bad. I mean, that was a wild fight, but he got choked out at the end of it. Uh, his last three wins, though, you know, he knocked out Rogerio Bonterini, he stopped Cody Garbrandt. I picked Askar Askarov to beat him, and he was able to kind of hold off Askarov's attack. So, uh, Carter France is really, he's really starting to surge at the right time. I'm still going to lean towards Moreno. Yeah, I think the dynamism of his game is going to be a bit of a problem. The five rounds is another kind of question mark here. Um, Kai Kato France says, I don't think he's ever had a five-round fight. Um, okay, no, he's had... He's been involved in one or two. I think just... Uh, yeah, he's been involved in two. One of them he lost in the first round. The other he won in the first Yeah, but Moreno's gone five rounds, and he's gone, like, to war. You know, the first that draw with Davis and Figueredo from 2020, one of the best fights of the year. That might have been the fight of the year, actually. I have to double-check. His most recent fight with Figueredo, you know, that went all five. He's been into the fourth more than once. He, he's fought five rounds multiple times. Uh, that's a bit of a question mark. Uh, it's one of those things, like, I'm gonna... Le- it's contributing to me leaning towards Moreno, but Kai Kara France is very, very good. Comes from a very good camp. Uh, he could easily win this. I'm gonna say easily, like, I don't mean he could win it easily, but the odds of him winning this are... I don't know who the, who the favorite is, but he could win this fight, and it should not surprise anyone. That's a good fight. Heavyweights. Uh, Derek Lewis will fight Sergei Pavlovich. 
Uh, Lewis is coming off of that loss to Tai Tuivasa. Pavlovich. He's only lost once ever. Fought Alistair over him in his UFC debut. Uh, won the last three, all first round stoppages. I mean, the pick is Derek Lewis. But. Uh, not, I don't think it's by a huge margin. Um, this is a big step up for Pavlovich. I mean, his last fight was uh, Shamil Abdurakhimov. And he stopped him in the first round, and Abdurakhimov is not exactly a slouch. He's a, Abdurakhimov is a very legitimate um, you know, gatekeeper. But Lewis is, by virtue of his sustained success alone, near the top of the division. So, big step up for Pavlovich. I, I lean toward again. I lean towards Lewis, but keep your eye on Pavlovich. Like, if he wins this, that's a big win for him. That's a statement win. Uh, and you know, Lewis is not exactly a young guy. He's 37. God, when I say he's not young, he's my age. I mean, I'm not 37 yet, but I'm close enough. I'm pretty darn close, actually. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so almost 40, and it's heavyweight, so it's not quite the same. He's got 36 fights. He's been with the UFC since 2014. I mean, he's had a lot of injuries. Like that, that's gonna come off the rails at some point. As mentioned, it is heavyweight, so it's not quite the same as other divisions. But uh, yeah. If it's if he's starting to f decline, uh, we'll know in a hurry. But I do still feel you know comfortable enough picking him here. Now uh, we have another flyweight fight. I believe this will serve as kind of a backup for the title fight. Um, Alessandro de Pantoja and Alex Perez. Wait, do we have a, do we do we just have a? Yeah, Pantoja is the one who will step up into the title picture if necessary here, but he's on the card anyway against Alex Perez. Um, Pantos has won his last two fights. I mean, his losses in the UFC are to Dustin Ortiz, Davison Figueredo, and Askar Askarov. Like, that's... That's a good level of opposition. You know, Ortiz was just a tough fight for him at some point, at that point in his career. Figueredo went on to become champion, and Askarov is... Very, very near the top of the division as well. So, I think I'm going to pick Pantoja here. Um, Perez is coming. He's been out of action for a while, actually. His last fight was the title fight with Davis and Figueredo, where he got guillotined in two minutes. And that's was 2022. He had another fight. Like he had some in. He had some weirdness. Um. He was supposed to fight Matt Schnell at one point. He was supposed to fight Askar Askarov. A uh, lot of fights moving around. A lot of weirdness. Um, he missed weight. He missed weight when he, they like got his fight against Schnell kind of reset. And he missed weight for that. He weighed 128, and Schnell refused to accept a catchweight fight, which I don't... I'm, I'm sure that pissed off the UFC brass. But I'm not mad about it. You signed a fight at a weight. You are not obligated to sign a new bout agreement if they miss weight. Yeah. Uh, See, so yeah, I'm not mad at Matt Schnell about that one. Between the layoff and everything, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean towards Pantoja. And at light heavyweight, pretty relevant fight for these guys actually. Uh, Anthony Smith and Magomed Ankalaev. Smith is on a three fight winning streak. He had a he had a rough stretch there, you know, from the l loss to John Jones, he rebounded by beating uh, Gustafson. Turns out that was more of a bellwether uh, for Gustafson than for Smith. Then he got beat. Glover Chair beat the crap out of him. Rakich beat the crap out of him. And to his credit, he rebounded against Devin Clark. Had this doctor stoppage against Jimmy Crute. Beat Ryan Spann in his last rec his last fight. Um, I'm still picking on Goliath, like. He's on a good winning streak. Yeah, I I think very highly of Ankalaev's overall ability. So, 
picking him here. That said, Smith is he's no pushover. Uh, I still think Uncle Live is the better fighter, but uh, you know, completely you discount Anthony Smith at your peril. So that's the main card. Um, we've had a lot of fights kind of fall out or have one part of a fight fall out. So some of these I do not have the finalized bout order yet. So forgive me. What we have listed for the prelims, the regular prelims, not the early prelims, um, Alex Morono and Matthew Semmelsberger. That's a pretty good fight, actually. I think I'm going to lean towards Semmelsberger. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't have anything against Morono, but uh, he's a bit hittable. And that's a that's not – Semmelsberger hits really hard. So I'm going to lean Semmelsberger, but that's a pretty good fight. The other one we have at the moment for the that portion of the preliminary card is Drew Dober versus uh, Rafael Alves. Feel okay picking Dober here. Um, yeah, Dober broke a two-fight losing streak in his last fight. He beat Terrence McKinney. Uh, feel okay picking him here. As for the, I'm going to jump to the early prelims because these are the ones that we have uh, bouts for, and then I'll list the annou other announced fights that I'm not sure of the bout order on, so got to go with me here. Uh, on the early prelims, Nikolai Negumarianu and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Ihor Potera, Poteria? Where is that gentleman from? I want to say Brazil. Uh, let me double check that. Let's have a look. Where are you? Uh, no, he is Ukrainian? Yes. Um, okay, I don't know how to pronounce that then, so I'm going to apologize if I butchered that and just assume that I did. Uh, anyway, Porteria is 20-2. and two. Solid record. Coming into the UFC here, he's on a... Good grief. He is on a 17-fight winning streak? Okay. I mean, some of these are over... Yeah, I mean, yeah, some of these are over guys he probably shouldn't have even been fighting. Good grief. Like one of his most recent fights, uh, when he was 15 and two, he beat a guy who was 0 and 4. If you're 13 and two, you probably shouldn't be fighting debuting fighters. Um, a little bit of record padding going on there, but that's still a long winning streak. Um. Negumarianu is 12-1. and one. Lost his UFC debut, but he's won three in a row since. I'm going to lean towards Negumarianu, but that that one could go... That one could go either way. Uh, the other one that we have here on the early prelims that we are aware of is Orion Kosi and Blood Diamond. Mike Mathel, uh, Mathetha. Both these gentlemen lost their UFC debuts. Hmm. Probably going to lean towards... Am I really going to lean towards Blood Diamond? Yeah, I think I am. I think I am. All right, as for the other fights that I'm just not sure the bout order on, uh, women's flyweight, ji Yun Kim and Jocelyn Edwards. Edwards... Had a good winner last time out. There's kind of a short notice thing up at Featherweight. She's back at Flyweight. Uh, Kim on a bit of a rough strat patch. She's lost her last three. Probably going to lean towards Edwards there. Uh, lightweights, Drakkar Close and Rafa Garcia. Uh, feel okay picking Close here. Um, he doesn't lose very often. In fact, he's only lost twice in his career, once to David Tamer, uh, where he just couldn't deal with the stick and move of Tamer. And then he had a heck of a fight with Benil Dariush. He lost, but that was a heck of a fight. Um, whereas Garcia, he is 2-2 two and two in the UFC. Won his last two, but yeah, I, I'm picking close there. Heavyweights, because more heavyweights. 
Um, Dante Mays and Hamdi Abdulwahab. Abdulwahab. Sorry, there's no I at the end there. Uh, Mr. Abdulwahab. He is what? Jordanian? Egypt. He's Egyptian. It's been way too long since I've seen the Egyptian flag now that I think about it. Or they might have changed it recently. Anyway, he's only 3-0. and He's taking this fight on short notice. Um, usually means you take the guy who's been in the UFC a bit. Uh, I mean, Mays is 2-2. Two and two. What is his last two? But it's heavyweight. Who the heck knows? I'll pick Mays because, again, the guy take, I tend to favor the guy not taking the fight on short notice. But, again, who knows? And at welterweight, Michael Morales will fight Adam Fujit. Fugit? Fudget? I don't know how to pronounce that gentleman's name. I'm going to assume one of those was correct. Um, Fugit is... I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Fugit until I hear otherwise. Because <laughs> that sounds the least like various profanities. <laughs> um... Yeah, he's taking this one on the shorter notice. He's replacing... Who's he replacing? Who's Morales supposed to fight? Uh, let's have a look here. Uh, Morales... He's supposed to fight Ramiz Brahimai. Uh, Morales... Had a successful UFC debut. He's, on a, he's undefeated. Yeah, pick him, Morales. Um, yeah, I feel okay picking Morales there. And that, yeah, that's the card as it currently stands. Again, the, the bout order on some of those has not yet been finalized. But it's not a bad main, it's not a bad main card. Uh, yeah, so I will be covering that this Saturday in the MMAZona411mania.com per usual. So if you're available and are interested, please do stop by, say hello. I always appreciate all of the support that you all are able to lend me in any capacity. Thank you very, very much. All right. UFC 280. The, uh, we talked a little bit about this card last week because the UFC confirmed for the vacant lightweight title, uh, Charles Oliveira and Islam Makashev. Well, they fleshed it out over the last week. And... Yeah, this is a great card. Co-main event currently slated to be for the bantamweight title, Aljamain Sterling defending against TJ Dillashaw. Not my favorite fight in the world, but I can live with... I can live with it. Live with it. Uh, feel pretty... I feel pretty good picking Sterling here. Um, I thought Dillashaw lost the fight with Sandhagen. And I, I think the years off, like, uh, that hurt. You know, the injury, he's, he's going to be coming back from a knee injury. Like, I'm not discounting Dillashaw's chances here. He's a very good counter-wrestler. He's the more dynamic striker. He's the heavier puncher. Like, that That's all real. But Sterling's long. He's good about fighting long, and... If these two tie up and start wrestling, I don't know who the better wrestler is. Sterling's a great back taker, and he's a really he's got good control from there. Uh, you know, I'm, I I'm gonna I'm gonna lean towards Sterling there, as far as that goes. As I sit as I sit here now, it's a really good fight. Also at bantamweight on that card, Sean O'Malley getting that step up in competition. He's fighting former champion Piotr Jan. That's a pretty easy pick for Jan. But that's a little surprised at that one, that that's where they took O'Malley after the, the fight with uh, Pedro Munoz. But, hey, we'll, we'll find out real fast if O'Malley's uh, been able to adjust his game or whatnot. Also announced at the moment, uh, lightweights Benil Daryush and Mateus Gamrot. Great fight. That's a great, great lightweight fight. At welterweight, Bilal Muhammad and Sean Brady. That's another really good one. Um, you've got... Look, Bilal Muhammad is not a terribly exciting fighter. But he is very hard to beat. 
I mean, he hasn't lost since he fought Jeff Neal in 2019. Uh, that he's he may not be winning over a lot of fans, but he's winning a lot of fights. And then you got Brady, who's undefeated. Uh, we're gonna see some we're gonna see some strong wrestling in this fight. It's a really good fight. My inclination is Brady, but Brady struggled a little bit at times with Michael Chiesa, and if he has, if he hasn't learned the appropriate lessons from that fight, Muhammad will he'll make him pay. Like he'll beat him. Uh, also announced Marina Rodriguez and Amanda Lemos. I'm a little bit whatever on that one. Uh, featherweight, Zubaira Tahugov and Lucas Almeida. That's a perfectly fine fight. Uh, but you know, whatever iteration that main card winds up taking, my hunch, it's going to be five fights. You can get Oliveira Makashev, Sterling Dillashaw, Jan O'Malley, Dariush Gamrot, and uh, Muhammad and Brady. It's my hunch. And that... I mentioned it. That's not... You don't have a lot of casual fan appeal out of that group. I mean, O'Malley might be the most well-known of them. Him or Dillashaw, probably. But, critically, that's an exceptional pay-per-view card. So, let us hope it holds together. Uh, Also announced this week... uh, This broke not too long after... uh, Just during the week at some point... Um, we finally have the final fight of Nate Diaz's current contract with the UFC. He will fight Hamzat Shemaev. That will be the main event for UFC 279. Um, apparently Nate Diaz, after watching Shemaev fight Gilbert Burns, Nate Diaz started wanting this fight. This is coming from, well, again, this has been reported by other people, so... You know, uh, take that for whatever it's worth. That's, um... Look, here's what's going to happen. Shemayev's going to beat the crap out of Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz is going to do one or two things that make you go, oh, and then he's going to lose. That's how this is going to go. That That's the only way this can really go. Um... But that's your main event. The rest of that, the other announced fights for that card, this card is lacking. I mean, I know that Nate Diaz has a big fan base, and God bless him, and if you're one of his fans, I have no issue, like, I'm not mocking anyone for it. But the rest of the fights currently announced. Uh, we have jo- a light heavyweight Johnny Walker and Iwan Kutalaba. Um, that's a big meh for me. Lightweights, Trey Ogden and Daniel uh, Zellhuber. Um, that's not, that, I don't know either of those gentlemen. Another lightweight, Nicholas Mata and Cameron Van Camp. Both guys have been in the, have fought in the UFC before, but I think they both have losing records. Women's featherweight, uh, Danielle Wolf and Norma Dumont. I don't know why they're keeping featherweight around at this point. Uh, welterweight, Lewis Cosi and Trevin Giles. That one might be all right. Flyweight, Daniel Da Silva and Victor Altamariano. Meh. Women's bantamweight, Irina Aldana and Macy Chasson. Potentially relevant fight for women's bantamweight. Uh, lean towards Aldana pretty heavily there, actually. Uh, strawweight, Elise Reed and Melissa Martinez. Middleweight, Jamie Pickett and Dennis Tululin. And at bantamweight, Alatong Hele and Chad and Helliger. Not a terribly compelling other group of fights. They, Again, they're going to be leaning heavily on the Diaz factor to draw the audience, but you need at least one solid supporting fight here, I think. And we don't have it yet. Now, that event's not until September 10th. So they've got time to find another one, but it, it needs a little bit of help there, I think. Uh, any other fights announced from the last little bit? I don't think so. Again, 280 just that thing over the last week just became a. If you're a if you're a serious fan, that's a must watch. It's absolutely a must watch event. Um, talk a little bit about Bellator. Um, a little bit of odds and ends here, I suppose. Uh, Kamaru Usman's brother. Um. 
Oh, uh, Muhammad? I think it's Muhammad Usman. Let me double check that. I want to make sure I get his name right. Uh, yeah, Muhammad Usman. He's UFC bound. Uh, Bellator had an event over the weekend. Uh, they lost. Uh, they were supposed to have, I think it was Tariq Masayev and uh, Patriki Freire. I think it's Patriki. Um, the relevant Pitbull brother. Uh, that fell out. Um, Masai have then, like, bludgeoned some poor schmuck. <laughs> I think it was Sydney Outlaw, actually, which I shouldn't dismiss Sydney Outlaw like that. Uh, yeah, it was Sydney Outlaw, so I, I don't mean... But he beat him in 27 seconds, so you know, Masai have, Yeah, it should be fighting for the belt. Um, I think the big thing that came about, uh, the main event for that particular card, Jason Jackson defeats Douglas Lima via unanimous decision, 50-45 across the boards. Uh, Lima missed weight. He weighed 172.8. Uh, not a great look. Not a great look at all. Um, Jackson might get a title shot off of this, and I wouldn't hate it. Uh, yeah, Douglas Lima, seemed, he's, on the, he's on the decline. I don't know how much longer he's going to be doing this. Uh, also on that card, Usman Nurmagomedov made short work of Chris Gonzalez, Lorenz Larkin, and uh, Muhammad, uh, excuse me, Muhammad uh, Bakamov. And went to a no contest. Um, it was odd. It was a little bit of an odd choice there by the referee. Uh, just throwing that out there. Um, anything else on that card worth? Now, it's mostly the Douglas Lima who... Guy has been, at various points in time, was you know one of the best welterweights in the world. He seems to be on his way out. Um, that was kind of the big tick, man. And, and Usman Nurmagomedov, you know, continuing to look pretty darn good. Uh, yeah, I think that was everything I had there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was Bellator. Bellator doesn't have. I joke about Bellator, and a lot of people do, because they've made it so easy on so many occasions, but I, I talk about them on occasion when I think it's warranted, and Douglas Lima in particular, the form he's been showing, I think warranted at least an acknowledgement. All right, that's everything I've got kind of listed here. Let me check Twitter, see if anything crazy is broken in the interim while we've been recording, and if not, we will do plugs and get out of here. No, nothing crazy. So, um... Yeah, the only... Jeez, hang on. Do I want to talk about that? All right, here's the only thing I'm going to say about this. Uh, I'm going to make, be very brief because this is just rumor at this point, like uh, speculation. But Vince McMahon, the uh, longtime CEO, chairman of the board, creative control, the force behind the uh, money-making juggernaut that is the WWE in the world of professional wrestling, he retired from his positions. There's been some... Uh, He's been the subject of some scandal recently, uh, an SEC investigation. Uh, you, I think the big one that they kind of got him on here, uh, assuming the reporting is accurate, was it would be like misuse of funds. And that's that's not nothing. It's uh, There's also a chance that more stuff has been uncovered, and this is a preemptive move by Vince to get more negative headlines away from the company. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, upheaval there and a potential seismic shift in the world of professional wrestling along these lines. The relevant point, that the reason I bring this up here, because I don't usually talk professional wrestling here, if Vince is out of... He's still the majority shareholder. He, again, he's resigning. He's retiring from his positions. But I don't believe he's liquidating more of his stock. So he does still... like There's still ownership there in some respects. It's a little bit of a murky area. He's also 77 years old and probably not that much longer for this side of the veil. Uh, I don't say that unkindly. You know, Vince is a very... If you could ever, and I don't think we'll get this in our lifetime, but if you could ever get a somewhat honest portrayal of Vince McMahon or an honest story about him, he is a fascinating character. That doesn't always mean good. Um, this is not me defending some of the gross and some of the illegal things that he's done. This is me saying, you know, he, 
certain humans are just interesting for a variety of reasons. And Vince, with you know some of the damage that he had to deal with as a person, and you're welcome to look up some of the abuse that he had to go through and how it you know, clearly affected him later in life. And uh, you know, the he's a very complicated figure in that respect, and that he did a lot of good for a lot of people. He gave a lot of people the opportunity to earn life-altering, not just life-altering, but like generationally life-altering money. And that's that means something. And he did some gross things, and he stepped on people, and he abused people, and that's all true as well. Like, um, you know, th- there was a line that there's a, I think it's said in Shakespeare, and I forget about who. But there comes a point when you, you can't, you can no longer answer the question of, is this a good person who does bad things or a bad person who does good things, and all you can do is just absorb kind of the humanity of them. And I think Vince is one of those people. But the point here is, if he is no longer in a position of serious uh, power within the company, and again, he would not have any power apart from, theoretically, whatever uh, his ownership stake would allow him to have, a sale of the WWE could be much more imminent. Of the potential suitors to buy it, among them would be, in all probability, Endeavor, which, as you all know, owns the UFC. So this little group of people could find themselves in possession of not just the... When I say monopolistic, I don't necessarily mean that in the predatory sense. I, the discussion about the UFC in that area is a different topic, but... When you think of mixed martial arts, people think of the UFC. There are still people who call it ultimate fighting. Now, that's going away a little bit, but that that was a thing until... Again, it's still a thing, depending on where you are and who you talk to. So... But they could own, like, the biggest brand in MMA and the biggest band in, brand in professional wrestling. For the vast majority of the world, professional wrestling is still the WWE. Now, that's not me dissing any of the other promotions. That's not me... Nothing like that. But, you know, who's the biggest? Who's the most successful? There is no comparison. AEW might be a bit of a critical darling, and they're growing, and I wish them well. They're still probably operating in the red, which is not... I've said this before. That's not the worst thing in the world, depending on how your trend and how your business is managed. You can operate at a loss and still be successful so long as you don't continue to operate at a loss uh, indefinitely right and when you do startups like when you try to break into areas like this you just kind of accept that first few years you're not going to turn a profit uh, any other you know, any other football startups that have tried the xfl the usfl etc like they're going to lose money the first few years while they try to find an audience you know, AEW's certainly the same way like they're finding an audience, they're finding their footing, but you know, they are paying people and they have overhead and they're probably going to be at, they're probably still operating at a bit of a loss. Now, not the end of the world as long as you trend positively when you're a startup trying to gain ground, but WWE is still the big one. And Endeavor might have the big MMA company and the big pro wrestling company both under their banner just as a thought. Uh, all right. Yeah, that's the last thing I want to touch on there. So let's let's do plugs. And again, that's the only reason I bring it up. Uh, otherwise, you know, I accept that you're not that interested in professional wrestling. Uh, my plugs for the week: professional wrestling. <laughs> I cover I cover it over in the MMA, over in the wrestling zone of 411mania.com. AW's Dark Elevation on Monday, MLW on Thursday. MLW seems to be on a bit of a break at the moment. So if they're not putting out content, I'm not covering anything there. But if they if they put anything out, I will cover it. And WWE SmackDown on Friday. Uh, SummerSlam is coming up this Saturday, so Friday is going to be the go-home show for that. But WWE's putting up essentially a paper... They're trying to do SummerSlam directly opposite UFC 277. That's that's going to be interesting. That'll be interesting. All right. 
Um, as for my other stuff, no podcast this week. Last week was a Damn You Hollywood for Where the Crawdads Sing. That's myself, Mark Rydelich, and Jason Teasley. So we talked about that. Again, Mark's on vacation, so no Damn You Hollywood this week. Next, no, uh, next week will be... Oh... I can't I remember... It's kind of a big one, too. Uh, yeah, uh, the League of Super Pets, the DC movie. So we will be doing that. Again, that's not this week. That's next week. And then yeah, other stuff. So full more of, more of that um, next week when we come back here. So, yeah, back here uh, and get then Saturday, UFC 277. We will be back here next week to review UFC on ES, uh, to review UFC 277 and preview uh, UFC... On ESPN 40, which is headlined by Tiago Santos and Jamal Hill. Yeah, they're at the Apex again. <laughs> oh, no, Sam Alvey's on the card. Why? <laughs> oh, I ruined my evening. Um, yeah, full preview next week. Yeah, it's not terribly compelling, but... You know... It could be worse. I'll just say that. It could be worse. So, see you back here next week for that. Until then, thank you all again very, very much. As always, stay safe out there and continue to be well, be safe, and behave.